All right. Now, today we're going to discuss this idea of the limiting reactant and percent yield. Now, whenever you think of something that's a limit, you should think like speed limit, right? You're not supposed to go above that amount or what would limit your ability to do something. Most times for most of us, it's money, right? If I had millions of dollars, I could sell around the world and have all kinds of fun. But there's usually something that limits our ability to do so. In a chemical reaction, we look at the same thing. We look at what substance do we have more of and what's going to stop us from being able to make more. So let's keep looking. So question asks, what happens if you run out of sugar? Sometimes we run out of stuff and that's perfectly fine. If I was making cookies and I had my specific recipe, but what if I only had, you know, one egg and it called for two? That limits the amount of cookies I can make at that time, unless I can get to Publix or whatever the case. So we have to look at the same concept in a reaction. So we give this real world example. I have 37 bicycle tires and 20 frames. How many bicycles can I make? Well, how would we normally look at it? If I have 37 bicycle tires and I get one frame plus two tires to equal one bike, right? Basically, I'm going to look at the tires as being the thing that's going to limit me. Well, why? Because they require two tires for every one frame. So if I run out of tires, I'm stuck. Well, let's see how many I can actually make. If I take 37 and divide it in half, I'm going to get 18 and a half, one tire left over, right? And I have 20 frames, so that means I can make 18 bikes. And I'd have two frames and one tire left over, okay? Now, we do the same thing when we talk about reactions. This is gonna determine how much of the product we can actually make in the end. And it's kinda easy to spot these. Usually, you'll be given two different amounts that you'll have to worry about. Both of them will be reactants though. Why do I make sure to point that out? I've had some weird stuff where people try to show me things and it's like they have a product and a reactant but it doesn't really fit the limiting reactant, if that kind of helps you out. Now, what you're going to end up doing is two different stoichiometry problems for each reactant. So let's look at the example. The question said, if given 10.6 grams of copper and it reacts with 3.83 grams of sulfur, how many grams of the product copper 1 sulfide can be formed? Both of them are going to end with the same substance. Well, let's take a look at it. So 10.6 grams copper. We went through this part before, so if I need to convert it into moles, I'm going to do one mole of copper, according to my periodic table, is 63.55 grams. Okay. Mole ratio. Well, moles I want will be copper one sulfide, so one mole copper one sulfide and two moles of copper. Okay, that makes sense. Last but not least, I need grams of copper one sulfide. <laughs> well, using my periodic table, 63.55, and I have two of them, plus a sulfur, I came out with the molar mass of 159.16. There we go. Now, that's one mole, right? Okay. Now, before I actually even plug anything in, notice how I'm going to be able to set this up. Well, we're still doing with sulfur, so we'll do the same idea. One mole S 32.06. Okay, okay. One mole sulfur, that's the one I'm getting rid of, and I'm converting it to copper one sulfide. So you remember this stuff we already wrote at the top? I just get to copy it. And this is one reason why some people love these problems, because it makes life a lot easier. Like 
this one more. Got it. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and plug these in. and We'll do it the same way that we've done before. So, 10.6 divided by 63.55 times 1 divided by 2 times 159.16. 13.27 okay well, let's do the bottom one 3.83 divided by 32.06 times 1 divided by 1 times 159.16 and for that one I came out with 19.01 now this is the decision making part we looked at what we'd be able to make with both of these at our current situation, right? We want to see which one is going to limit our amount of product. So that means we're looking for the smallest value that we can deal with at the end, the smallest amount of product we can make. And we'll say that that is the one that gave us our limiting reactant. So 13.27 or 19.01. Well, 13.27 is less than 19.01 so that means that's how much product we actually would make or that we will make from this which means our limiting reactant in this case is copper now we don't get rid of the other one just yet because that means sulfur is our reaction that we say is an excess so copper is limiting and sulfur is an excess now, something I want to pay very close attention to. A lot of people will look at the amounts that you're given in the beginning and say, oh, well, that means that sulfur is going to be the one that's limiting because it has a smaller amount here. No, we're always looking at how much of the products that we make. The product is the key. And we can start off with however much, but many times it'll come down to how it works out in the mole ratio. Okay, let's look at another example. So if 10.3 grams of aluminum react with 51.7 grams of copper sulfate, how much copper will be formed? Okay, similar idea. We have two givens, which means two tables. So let's go ahead and jump into it. We'll make our first table. 10.3 grams AL. And it says we're looking to see how much copper we're going to make. So let's go ahead and proceed. We have our one mole of aluminum and according to my periodic table 26.98 grams. Now I need my mole ratio. So aluminum, copper, and so I'm wanting moles you want over moles you have. So three moles of copper moles I have two moles aluminum okay that part makes sense that matches what we have in our balanced equation last but not least I need copper so I need grams of copper so periodic table oh yeah that's what it was 63.55 grams copper and one mole copper my units would cancel. Life is wonderful. Okay. Now let's go ahead and set up the next one. And then we'll come back and get our answers to make sure we're good. So the second given we had was 51.7 grams of copper sulfate. Copper 2 sulfate at that. Okay. Well, one mole copper sulfate. I don't have the molar mass for that one offhand, so 63.55 plus 32.06 plus 4. Okay. Hey, didn't we just do with that? Huh. But I got 159.61 grams. Okay. So, mole ratio. Well, according to my equation, moles I want 3 moles copper and three moles copper sulfate okay last but not least copying what we did up there we get to cheat off ourselves a little bit here 55 
over one mole. Okay. My handwriting looks ugly, but we have them both there. So let's go ahead and work it out. 10.3 divided by 26.98 times 3 divided by 2 times 63.55. And I came up with 36.39 grams. Okay, well, let's look at the second one. 51.7 divided by 159.61 times 3 divided by 3 times 63.55 came up with 20.58 grams copper so based off what we're looking at here it looks like look for the smaller one which one gave you the smaller amount we would say that our limiting reactant in this case is going to be our copper sulfate because it produced only 20.58 grams. Whereas then that will make our aluminum our excess reactant. This is the one we have extra of, okay? Now, last thing we wanna talk about here is this thing called percent yield. Now, Limiting reactant is saying, okay, if I have this amount, how much can I actually make from this? Percent yield is now saying, okay, did you actually do what you said you were going to do? Now, this is definitely different than what you would see in a driver's ed class. Many of you are taking online, I know. But we realize that in our world, everything doesn't work out perfectly. So we look at a couple of different things. We look at what we call actual yield. That's what you actually get in the lab. We get the theoretical yield, what the equation said you should do. And then we do a ratio to see what we actually come up with. Well, the actual in a lab, that, that one you have to do. So that means either you'll have to find it by doing the lab, getting your solid or whatever the case. Or it'll be given in some way, shape or form. The theoretical this should be familiar because basically that's what we did in the previous slides. When we did our stoichiometric tables, those long charts, that was finding the theoretical yield. If everything goes perfect, this is what you should get. Now, our goal in the end is we want to be as close to 100% as possible. We know that most times we won't be, but we have to get as close as possible to 100%. We also don't want to go over 100%. That would be bad. So if we're looking at the question, we want to look for keywords that'll tell us which value is what. It says 6.78 grams of copper is produced. Whoa, wait, hold on. So that much is produced. I feel like that's telling me that's our actual yield. So 6.78 grams Cu. Okay. When 3.92 grams of aluminum is reacted with an excess of copper 2 sulfate. Now, some of you will look at that word excess and say, I heard that before, but why? what do we do with the copper sulfate? Absolutely nothing here. It's telling you you had extra. So it's basically saying all of your aluminum here is going to be gone. You don't have to worry about it. But we have to figure out theoretically how much was I supposed to make? Well, let's go ahead and put it through. So my given 3.92 grams aluminum. Changed up my pen color for you guys. And I'm going all the way to find my copper. How do I know copper? Because that's what was highlighted in the question. This is how much copper I produced. So one mole of aluminum is 26.98 grams. My mole ratio says when I put in two moles of aluminum, I'm supposed to get three moles of copper. And last but not least, I need my molar mass of copper, 63.55, and one mole. So let's go ahead and plug it in. 3.92 divided by 26.98 times 3 divided by 2 times 63.55. 
<clears throat> Oops, I think I did. I got 13.85 grams of copper. So that's what I'm going to write up here. My theoretical yield was 13.85 grams. Now, for the last step, what is our percent yield? Let's go ahead and get rid of this. Last thing we need to do is figure out percent yield. Well, how do you find percent of anything? Part over whole times 100, right? Similar idea here. So if I'm going to go ahead and do this, I'm going to take my actual over my theoretical times 100. So my actual yield was 6.78. And my theoretical was 13.85 times 100. And that'll tell me how efficient I was or how good a job I did. So 6.78 divided by 13.85 times 100. Don't forget that. And I came out to 48 0.95%. Now, taking a look at that value, it doesn't seem like I did a really good job here. It seems like we lost a lot of product somewhere. And that's one of the areas that we can go in and then discuss and figure out how can we make that better. Remember, when we look at chemistry overall, the idea is we want to be able to take reactions, take these materials, and get them to do certain things. If I'm only producing 48%, almost 50%, it's not really worth the investment, the time, or my money. And I want to be able to make sure that my money works as best as possible. Now, a couple of things that you want to know just as we wrap this up. Again, tells you how efficient you were. It cannot be bigger than 100%. If you come out with something that says 110%, that's a lie somebody told you. You can't do that. and it, it just can't do it. Theoretical yield should always be larger than your actual yield and why? Because usually if you have impurities, the reaction didn't go uh, to completion, you lost some in the process, all of those different factors will begin to play a role. Now, I know that was a longer video, but now you're ready to go ahead and practice and finish this thing up. I look forward to talking with you and looking at more examples. Have a great day.